This week we're going to talk about another question uh, here on Easter Sunday, and that is, does God really love me? Does God really love me? Me. Now, John 3.16 is one of the most quoted Bible passages there are, okay? And uh, some of us have memorized it from the time we were young. Others, this will be the first time, and that's great. But here's what it says. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. For God so loved the world. Okay, I can understand that. Sure, you know? It's a lot easier to believe sometimes that God loves the world than it is to believe that God loves me. Anyone understand and relate to that? Sometimes it's easy to make it impersonal, right? Yeah, God loves the world, but then we forget that that actually includes me. God loves me. God loves the world. Okay, different things, right? Why is that difficult for us? Well, I think part of it is because I know how bad I am. I know how many times I mess up. I know how insignificant I am compared to all the other things that are going on in the world. You know what I mean? I mean, you get terrible tragedies, Halfway around the world, and God's way busier. That's way more important than just me. And so sometimes it's easy for us to kind of forget that, you know what, God does love me. And I want you to know this morning that God loves you. Now, even saying that statement, God loves you, is taking it off of me, right? I can say that about you. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. But then, oh, see, I don't have to talk about me because I'm insignificant because I'm unlovable because of all the dumb things that I've done, all the times I've messed up. But we're going to deal with this question today because this is real. This is real stuff. God does love you and he does love me. Now, I've worked with a number of people over the years and I find that there are at least two main barriers that we come up against as human beings. Two main barriers that can make it difficult for us as people to receive God's love. And I'm going, to, I'm going to address each of these, and they're going to take the form of two questions. Here's the first question we're going to look at today. Why would God love someone as bad as me? Why would God love someone as bad as me? With all my faults, with all my insecurities as a human being, with all the junk in my life, why on earth would God bother with someone like me? Why would I be special in any way? Now, I want you to close your eyes for just a minute. I want you to use your imagination. Are you ready? I want you to imagine something. I want you to go back in time in your own mind, and I want you to remember a time when you were maybe a little kid, or maybe yesterday. <laughs> remember the first time that you, it's definitely not yesterday, but anyway, remember the first time that you messed up in a really big way? Do you remember all the emotions that came with that? You can open your eyes now. Think about it. I, I know for me, um, the, the first thing that I remember I don't know why, but I was probably seven, eight, I can't, I'm not exactly certain, but I remember my brother got me so mad that I picked up a rock and I threw it at him. <laughs> and as I threw it, I dropped every four-letter word I could think of. Do you remember this? Oh, M, gosh. I do. That's my mom, by the way. Say, say hi, mom. Hi, mom. Mom, say hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Say, mom, uh, mom, say, I'm humiliated, everybody. No. It was probably one F word, but it was. And it just, it just, hey. And my mom grabbed me and brought me in the house and did the whole Ralphie thing, shoved the bar of soap in my mouth. <laughs> And for some reason, I never did that again. I don't, I, it worked. I have a nervous twitch from the poisoning, um, or blind sometimes, right? But no, it, you know, it, and it's just, it's just, for some reason I learned it. But that was, that was a, a monumental experience. I vividly remember that. Uh, that, that made a big impression in my, own, in my own life. So maybe you have something similar, uh, maybe something a little bit more humorous or what have you. But either way, you know, we can all admit that from time to time, you know, maybe we were bratty. I was a bratty kid. I know that's shocking to most of you. Uh, I have, I have a, a picture from kindergarten, and I don't even know who took it or where it went, because I saw it not too long ago. I don't know where it, remember? So I'm in elementary school, grew up in Ipswich, uh, Doyon Elementary School. Anyone know where that is? Lambrook Road, yeah? Okay. So the picture is in black and white, not because I'm that old, but just because that's the, the, the film they used. But anyway, I have my hands 
up against the brick side of the, the building. It's during recess. And I'm turning back, looking at the camera, doing this. I know that's shocking for most of you that know me, but um, I was a bratty kid. I had some issues I had to work through, right? It's just the way it is. My list of sins kept growing as I did. It was amazing. If you've ever wondered how God could love someone as bad as you, you're not alone. You're not alone. In fact, in the Bible, there are a whole pile of, of illustrations about people that felt the same way. Uh, there was a, one guy by the name of Job, and then there was another by the name of Apost the Apostle Paul, is who he was, uh, but his name was Saul, and then it became Paul. Uh, they both battled similar insecurities about themselves. You know, I mean, I'm not that good. I'm not that, that important, so why on earth would God love me, right? So let's start there by looking at uh, the book of Job. Now, this is the Bible. We call it the Holy Bible. It is a collection of uh, about 66 different writings. It's broken up into two main parts. There's the Old Testament, which is about three-quarters of the book, the front three-quarters. And then the back uh, quarter would be the New Testament, Okay, so we're going to look at Job, which is actually right before Psalm. So if you take the book and you split it right in half, you should come pretty close to Psalm or Proverbs. If you come to Psalm or Proverbs, flip back. The book right before the book of Psalms is the book of Job, okay? And if you've got one of these Bibles that we have here in the seats, uh, underneath the seats in front of you, um, it's on page 531. We're going to look at Job chapter 42, verses 5 and 6. Job was actually a servant of God, and a terrible tragedy happened, and a long story short, uh, he lost all of his children, he lost all of his wealth, he even lost his own health, terrible things happened, and at the end of this story, God comes back and blesses him for being faithful in the midst of difficult calamities that came his way, horrible things you wouldn't want to wish on your worst enemy, and yet Job stayed faithful to God. And so God reveals his love for Job through everything that happened. And here's, here's how uh, Job responds as far as how he feels about himself. He says this, My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, look at what he says, Therefore I despise myself. And he goes on. He says, I despise myself. In your comparing my, who I am with you, I despise myself. I mean, I'm nothing. I'm no one. So why would you choose to love me, in a sense, right? Is kind of what he's saying. Job was a very righteous person. And like I said, I mean, God honored him because he stuck it out. And yet, he felt that he wasn't worth it, right? He felt, you know, I, I despise myself. Let's look at Paul now, the Apostle Paul. We're going to flip to 1 Corinthians 15, 9. Again, you're going to flip ahead. This is in the New Testament, the first book of the New Testament is Matthew. It's Matthew, then Mark, Luke, John. Those first four books of the New Testament are the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts, okay, Romans, and then 1st and 2nd Corinthians. That's page 1139, if you're using one of these. 1st Corinthians 15, 9. This is Paul. The guy wrote practically half of the New Testament, okay? So he's pretty important in God's plan. All right, for spreading the, the, the great gospel message of Jesus. But here's what he says. He says in, in verse 9 of chapter 15, 1 Corinthians, he says, For I am the what? I am the least of the apostles, and do not even what? Don't even deserve to be called an apostle, because why? I persecuted the church. What? What? What do you mean? What are you talking about? He did. Before he became a believer in Jesus, he thought that the Christians were blasphemers, fancy word. He thought the Christians were bad. They were perverting, you know, the belief in God, faith in God. And so he took it upon himself to try to stamp out, yeah, good luck, right? Try to stamp out this new religion that was sprouting out from this, this, this guy, this, this Jew, you know, who was crucified and, and suddenly everybody thinks he's risen from the dead, which he did, but he didn't believe it at that time. And so what happens, Paul realizes he comes face to face with the reality of who Jesus is. Jesus appears to him and he realizes the error of his ways and he begins to serve, uh, to serve Jesus and spread the, the great gospel message of what Jesus has done for all of us. And yet Paul had doubts. I mean, look at his past. You know, for us, okay, we trip and we fall and we've messed up from time to time. Paul actively 
had Christians killed. He had them actively, in a, he attempted to actively stamp out them, stamp them out. Amazing. So he felt pretty bad, right? Paul knew that he was responsible for all of this. And so, my goodness, that awareness made him feel that he was the lowest. You can almost, you can almost hear him wondering to himself, how could God love someone who has done so many bad things? How could you love me, God? Aren't you angry with me? Aren't you disgusted by me? Nope. Can any of you relate to that? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. So here's the first question. Why would God love someone as bad as me? Here's the second one. Why would God love someone so insignificant? Again, I've already touched on it. God has countless things to deal with. He's got the hurricanes. You know, he's, got, he's got tornadoes and all these terrible things, political unrest, racial issues to deal with, right? I mean, nearly 7 billion other people in the world, so why on earth would he care about someone like me, someone who's so insignificant? I'm just a speck of dust compared to everybody else. Why would you care about me, God? If you've ever felt that way, you're not the only one either. The Bible says that uh, a guy by the name of, you probably haven't heard of him, but Moses, (laughs) King David, both of them, they felt very insignificant. They struggled with feelings of significance. When God said that he was going to send Moses to deliver the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, Moses said, very well then, Lord, I will stand strong and be the leader you've called me to be, and I will march forward and deliver your people, right? If you know the story, you'd be like, yeah, right, not even close. Moses kept whining and complaining. It's hilarious to read, actually. Uh, whining and complaining, and he's like, but I can't speak well, I stutter, or I, I'm not, you know, of, of good word, you know, of good tongue, I can't speak well, and please, God, you know, not me, not me, and God kept, keeps persisting, no, no, you're, you're my man, you know, and finally, the last thing that Moses said before, it says, God's anger burned against Moses, he said, oh, Lord, please send someone else to do it, I just find that so humorous. Have you ever done that? (laughs) You know, maybe it's not you and God, maybe it's you and your boss. Oh, please ask someone to stay late today or whatever, right? Moses was not confident at all in in himself. I mean, who am I? I am no good. I can't do anything right. What's the point here? Why are you asking me? In in Exodus chapter 3, verse 11, go ahead and flip there. It's way in the beginning of the Bible. Uh, The first book is Genesis, the second is Exodus. There you go. Number two, okay, page 57, way in the beginning. Exodus chapter 3, verse 11. And here it is, right? Moses said to God, Who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? In other words, why me? I'm insignificant. You know, I'm a nobody. King David... Again, he was trying to lead the Israelites to worship uh, God, and, and yet uh, suddenly he, he felt very insignificant. Turn uh, about 400 pages ahead, 1 Chronicles chapter 29, 1 Chronicles chapter 29. This is, again, uh, King David speaking to God and reminding God, hey, by the way, God, I'm insignificant in case you didn't know, okay? And uh, God has an interesting response to him, right? But 1 Chronicles 29, 14. It's on page 423, and here's King David, and here's his response, right? He says this, um, <clears throat> tapping God on the shoulder, um, but, but who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Okay, the New Living Translation says it this way, that we, should, that we could give anything to you. Okay, to catch the, the point of what he's trying to say. Who am I and who are my people that we could give anything to you? You don't need anything, God. You know, we couldn't give anything to you, right? And we've only given you what comes from your hand. In other words, everything that we could give you is what you've already given us back, so it's kind of weird, right? Who am I, God? I'm, I'm insignificant. I don't matter. What, whatever, you know? None of this matters. You see, he realized that everything the people had received from God came from him already. So what do I do? What do I have? How am I 
insignificant at all. Why would God love someone as insignificant as me? Have you ever felt that way? Anybody else? Folks, when it comes to God and his great love for us, it's amazing how many misconceptions people have. How many things that people believe about God. Folks, when, uh, one of the things that, that I deal with on a regular basis is uh, when I'm at social events, I have great conversations with people. You know, I'm actually an introvert, which means that, you know, I get energy, I don't get energy, I get energy from being alone, okay? Doesn't mean that I'm a bad person, it's just the way I'm wired, I'm an introvert. You know, there's extroverts, there's introverts. Extroverts, when they're around people, they get jazzed up. Introverts, people just take energy away. Doesn't mean that because I hate people, it's just, it is what it is, right? It's just the way it is. And by the way, I don't hate you either, okay? I lost my train of thought, what was I saying here? Um, but at social events, I enjoy it. I'm, I'm outgoing, you know. Um, people have said that you always know when Dan's in the room. I'm sorry, but it's just the way it is, so I try to temper that. But the conversations I have with people, are, they go so well. They go great until they ask me what I do for a living. <laughs> and then it gets really awkward. And I'm like, God, can you give me a way to explain that this in such a way that doesn't alienate me? Because the moment I say it, right, I'm like, uh, well, I'm a pastor. It just messes everything up. <laughs> At that moment, people will be like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> Martha, start the car. <laughs> it just freaks people out. I, I tried coming up with other things. Oh, well, I work with people. Oh, what do you do? Dang it. Um, I'm actually a, an advisor and a counselor. Oh, awesome. What's the name of your practice? You know, it's like, what do you do? Um, the Holy Spirit? It doesn't go over too well. So it's like, I don't know how to do it. So I usually deflect, you know, and I pretend I don't hear until they ask me, did you hear? Then I have to not lie. And I'm like, oh, I did hear. I'm just uh, selectively listening. Then they back away. Anyway, I just, I can't win, you know? So I try to stall as much as possible, you know, when I'm having conversations with people. It's not that I'm ashamed of what I am, believe me. I just don't want people to shut me down, you know? One time, our neighbor right over here, oh my goodness. So our kids grew up together, Aaron, my youngest, um, and uh, their oldest were pretty much the same age. And so uh, they played sports together, the whole thing. And I remember there was, I think it was... Um, Soccer, or uh, I can't remember what the sport was. Doesn't matter. Anyway, so my neighbor's there, and I'm walking up to him. I'm like, "Hey, Steve, good to see you. How you been?" And he's with some of his friends, and so Steve responds by, in front of his friends, by saying, "Oh, hey guys, this is Dan, the pastor." <laughs> Not a chance. That relationship would never develop, right? And so I'm just like, you know, this is ridiculous. And I'm like, um, <clears throat> "What's your name, John? Hi, John. Uh, this is Steve, the landscaper." The things we do, right? It's, it's crazy. But anyway, the point is what? It's insignificance is what we all feel, right? It, it's just the way it is. But, you know, sometimes when, when God comes up, I know it, it was the case for, for our neighbor, but sometimes when God comes up, you know, you can see that there's something going on just beneath the surface. There's a lot of anger, seething anger that people have toward God sometimes just just beneath the surface, you know? It's like, it's like they, they say, well, you know what? Good for you, but I don't believe in God. You know, they either slink away or they confront it, you know? It's like, well, I don't believe in God. So my response, you know, why not? Well, God is just out to get us. He's just out to get us, that's it. He's always angry. He's just sitting up there in heaven, just waiting for us to mess up so he can send us to hell. My response is, well, I don't believe in that God either. What? is usually how they respond. What are you talking about? You're a pastor. You're supposed to believe in God. The God I know and I believe in is a God who is full of love. He is a God who is full and filled with compassion for you and for me. He doesn't look at us and just laugh an evil, sinister laugh and rub his hands and back away. No, that's not the God I know. The God I know is intimately interested in your life and in my life. He is passionately in love with you. 
You're all he thinks about. The God I know and believe in is the very essence of what love is. The God I know and the God I believe in is the one who defines what love is. He defines it. God is love. Love is not God. God is love. He defines what love is. And here's the main point today. It's up on your screen. God is love. Turn to 1 John 4, 8 through 10. That's way at the back. One of the last collections of writings. 1 John 4, 8 through 10. It's page 1,209. God is love. The second part of verse 8 starts with that. It ends with that. It says, God is love. Look at verse 9. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He sent his son as an, an, an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus raised his hand and said, I will pay the price for their sin. God did the most loving thing anyone could ever do. He became one of us through Jesus. He took the punishment that you and I are responsible for, the punishment for our sins that we are required to pay. He took it upon himself. He died in our place. And he did it so that we could be forgiven. He did it so that we could have a relationship with him, with God, to restore that. Because when we sin one time, the Bible says that we are separated from God. God doesn't walk away from us. I've used this analogy before, but imagine that one-ton boulder, okay? Imagine that, and then imagine a, a, a brick, And if you were to take a hammer or a wedge and nail it between the two, kind of bang it in, what's going to happen to the boulder? How many of you think the boulder is going to move? How many of you think the brick's going to move? Absolutely. We're the brick, God's the boulder. Sin comes between us and we move away from him. It separates us. It divides us. It comes between us. And Jesus said, hey, wait, I will pay the price. I will die for the sin they have committed because of my love for them, because I want to have a relationship with them, because you are precious to me. I'm willing to go through this for you. God is love, folks. That's the definition of it. God did the most loving thing that anyone could ever do, and that's the kind of love that changes everything, and that's the kind of love that we celebrate today on Easter Sunday. Okay, but even if I know that in my mind, how many of you know it's an entirely different thing to live out? I know the truth, fine. Jesus died for me, he loves me, I'm important to him, blah, 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 blah. But I'm gonna live this out. I'm gonna live this real truth that I've embraced, that I've learned. I'm gonna live this out. I'm not gonna live out as if someone who's been forgiven. I'm not gonna live that way. I'm gonna live out what I believe about myself, what I've been told maybe my whole life. Okay, fine. God loves me. I'm very significant to him, but I I don't understand that. And so therefore, I'm going to pretend that that's not true. I'm going to live differently. I'm going to live out that I am not significant. It's hard. It's hard for us. I know that God loves the world, but what about someone as bad and insignificant as me? (laughs) I know that God loves the world. I know that God loves you, but uh, I'm not worthy of it. Folks, hear me. God loves each and every one of us. That is not just what he does. It is who he is. He embodies love itself. He loves you no matter what you've done. He loves you right where you are. You don't have to clean up your life. Do you understand the power and the significance of this? You don't have to clean up your life first. I mentioned this last week. My wife's a home cleaner, right? And when she first starts to clean houses, often the first few times, 
the homeowners will straighten things up first, clean it up for her, because they're embarrassed, which makes zero sense, right? But they do that. We don't have to do that with God. He already knows what we look like in the morning. He already knows how bad our breath is. And yet he still loves us. He knows we're going to screw up today and tomorrow. And he still loves you. He is God. He knows every mistake you're ever going to make. Every stupid put your foot in your mouth again that you're ever going to do. And yet he still loves you. That's awesome. God is love. God is love. So now when the devil says that you're worthless, when he tells you that you're insignificant, you can reject him and his big fat lies. Because it's not true. So how does God impact our lives with his love? How does God's love impact our lives every day? God's love first. God's love covers your sins. God's love covers your sins. 1 Peter 4, 8. 1 Peter, it's page 1,203. Just a few pages back from where you are now. 1 Peter 4, 8. Second part. Love does what? Love covers over a multitude of sins. Love covers over a multitude of sins. Folks, there is no better sin covering in the world than the love of God. God's love for you is so powerful. What Jesus did on the cross for you is so powerful that your sin no longer can control you. We don't have to be controlled anymore by it. When I was in high school, God burned within me a a really deep passion to share Christ's love with my friends. And I remember there were three of them that I... uh, that I prayed about, and one of them, his name was Larry, and I remember vividly one day, I just was pouring my heart out to him and sharing with him about how much God loves him and and how much I cared about him. I I loved him deeply, and I I remember him saying one day, I'll never forget it, he said, I can't believe how much you love me, Dan. I remember him saying that vividly, and I remember my immediate response was, yeah, but just imagine how much more God loves you, and that's so true. True. Larry called back a couple weeks later, and he told me that he became a believer. He reached out to Jesus. Praise God for that. I've lost touch with Larry, but I know that God hasn't. Some of you might be thinking, yeah, but you don't know how bad I've been. You don't know how bad I've been. God's unconditional love, whatever. But you don't know how bad I've been. I know the one who does, and I know he's madly in love with you. Anyway, God hates sin. God hates sin, and it is true, okay? God does not just say, no big deal, slap you on the back. It's all right, I'll let that one slide. No, sin is serious business. God hates sin. It's so clear in Scripture. He hates it, and yet what? His love for us led him to become one of us through Jesus, and his shed blood covered our sin, even the worst sins that you can imagine, even sins that you can't even imagine. That's the kind of love he has for you and for me. The Bible teaches that in the garden, Adam and Eve were naked and they were happy. Some of you are thinking, okay. (laughs) They were naked and they were happy. It wasn't an issue. It wasn't a stumbling block. And yet when they sinned against God, they became naked and ashamed. Why? Sin entered the world. Because they disobeyed God. Guilt and shame came into the picture And yet in his love for them, in spite of what they did, they blew it big time. God, in his love for them, sacrificed an innocent animal, took its skin and covered their nakedness, covered their sin. In Jesus' parable of the lost son, the youngest son comes back to his, or after he took his father's wealth and blew it all, 
uh, spent it all, it was gone, right? After all of this, left home, uh, it says he, he blew it all on wild living. Uh, what did the father do when his, when his son came back? His son came back dirty and smelly and completely broke. And so what did the father do in response? In his love, the father covered his son with his best robe. Why? Because the father loved his son, his child. Anyway, his love covers your sin. Oh, but I've done so many. God still loves you. He's madly in love with you. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We went through a powerful weekend called First Love, and we're going to be bringing it back. It looks like the fall, unfortunately, at this point, but we're definitely going to be bringing this back to give more people an opportunity uh, to experience it. But one of the things that they do, and what I want to do right now, is I want to personalize this verse. I want to personalize this verse, okay? You see up on the screen, there's a blank. I want you to put your name in the blank. For God so loved, oh, the world is easy, but Dan Millette. <laughs> For God so loved Dan Millette that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him, that when I believe in him, I won't perish. I'll have eternal life. Put your name in there. For God so loved Kelly. For God so loved those in Danvers. For God so loved fill in the blank, right? For God so loved you that he gave Jesus to die for the sins you committed, to pay the price, to take the penalty from you because of his love for you, because he wants a relationship with you. And he doesn't want eternal separation, which is what our sin leads to. His love covers over your sins. It doesn't matter how bad they are. It doesn't matter how messed up you are. He loves you because he is love. And here's a second point. God's love makes you significant. His love isn't temporary. His love is not conditional like we're used to. His love is, con is, is everlasting. It's eternal. In Jeremiah 31, we read these words. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. God is drawing some of you today, right here, right now. He is pursuing you, and if, you be, if you're honest with yourself, you know it. You feel something going on inside. You are significant because you're on his heart. In Luke 15, we, we read about three parables that Jesus told, and we mentioned the lost son. Right? The, the, the father waited for him to come home and he received him warmly because of his love for him. Right? Then there was you know, the parable of the lost coin. The, that's when there was a woman who tore apart her entire house to find one coin of great value. And then there's the lost sheep. And that story is about the sh a shepherd who left the remaining 99 sheep to go and find the one who wandered away. The shepherd's love for the one made the one sheep significant. Did you catch that? The shepherd's love for that one sheep made that one sheep significant. He could have said, well, I got 99 more. It's fine. That's like me saying to you know, one of my four sons, you know, well, we still have three, so. <laughs> it's horrible, right? <laughs> Is that you today? Are you the one missing sheep? Is that you? Maybe you used to know God. Maybe you used to walk with him. You know, maybe, you know, something happened, though, and, and you got hurt. You got mad. Somebody in church did something stupid, and they offended you. We know that happens all the time because the church is made up of imperfect people who serve a perfect God. And so there is no perfect church. There are idiots, I should say. I should say. I should kind of clarify what I mean by that. There are people that do idiotic things, okay? But guess what? They're also forgiven because they're imperfect. So if you've been hurt and wounded on behalf of Jesus himself, I am sorry. It should not have happened. It was wrong. No matter what you've been told, you are precious to him. You are loved. Maybe you're the guy 
like that who walked away. I want you to know that he's coming for you, though. God's coming for you, even if you've walked away. Maybe you're the guy who says, I don't believe in God. Well, guess what? You know what? The, the God that we serve is not angry with you because you've chosen to not believe in him. He's not disgusted by you. He's not ashamed by you. He's not offended by you. He is filled with love for you. If you are the one, he's coming for you too. Many of us feel vulnerable when we start talking about love. That's just weird. Or that's just, you know, it's just awkward. I don't want to talk about that. I'm afraid of being rejected. Start talking about this love stuff. I remember in 10th grade, there was a girl who slipped me a note <laughs> from another girl. And I opened the note, and among a bunch of other stuff, she said, do you like me? Because I really like you. I know that's a miracle, but anyway. <laughs> she didn't want to get rejected, so what did she do? Oh, well, she said that, he said that, you said that. He said, oh, my word, right? Here, can you give this to him who give it, gives it to you? And then you just pass it along. Uh, you know, you just don't want to get rejected, you know? It's, uh, and sometimes it makes us awkward, right? Well, we ended up going to the movies uh, to see a little film playing uh, called Back to the Future. But it's risky to love, isn't it? It is. It's risky to love. There's a risk to it. As kids, we all had kinds of ways that we would um, find out if someone liked us. You remember those? To not get rejected, you know, not getting too vulnerable. You know, do you remember elephant shoes? You go... Or how about olive juice? <laughs> I love you. Wrong. And they're like, ew, it's fine. Then I'll go get the elephant shoes to someone else. Right? Of course, I had a classic one. Some of you might remember this. I'd, I'd use one that was extremely successful. It didn't quite land my beautiful wife, but I'd uh, walk up to a girl that I thought was really, really, really pretty. And I would say, hey, you want to kiss? <laughs> I'm serious. I used it all the time. She'd usually look at me and go, Ugh! And then I'd be like, fine, then I'll have one. <laughs> Heads up. Heads up. Ready? Heads up. It's like a rock concert. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, they hurt. Here you go. I like chocolate, by the way. There you go. More where that came from. Hershey's. Anyway. And it worked, actually. And then, of course, when the girl would be like, she'd lean in or whatever, then I'd keep it in my pocket. I wouldn't be, told, I wouldn't be pulling this, this kiss out. I'd be... Using those things. <laughs> Did I just say that? Is, is this going in the direction? I... Okay, here's the point. Here's the point. You'll never forget this Easter Sunday service. The point is, <laughs> loving first, loving first takes a very big amount of vulnerability, doesn't it? Huge. And it makes the other person feel incredibly significant. That's what God did for you. That's what God did for you, folks. He already took that risk by loving you. Do you understand how significant that makes you? Do you understand how significant and how special that makes you and me? He took all the risk on himself. 1 John 4.19 says that we love because he first loved us. That is what makes you significant. You're able to love because he loved you first. One thing that helps me to understand God's love for me is, is being a dad to four sons. Or to any kids, really. It doesn't have to be a magic number or gender, but... In my case, 
being a dad to four kids. You know, when Jake was born, I loved him so much that it hurt. And now all I want to do is hurt him. Um, <laughs> but, it's, it's, but I thought to myself, how could I love another human being as much as I love him? Oh my goodness, really? And then I had Kyle. God gave us Kyle, cute little pudgy cheeks. <laughs> Such a love for other people and a compassion for other people. Man, God expanded my heart. Wow. Suddenly I, I realized that loving two children with an equally intense and yet very personal kind of love was possible. And then God gave me the amazing Adam. And I found myself with a very special love for the most adorable kid ever. Oh, my word. And just when I thought I couldn't love anymore, God gave us little Aaron. Personality plus. <laughs> Sweet and kind. And he used to constantly write me love notes. It's awesome. I actually have one here. Happy Father's Day with someone who needs massive dental work. <laughs> it's the coolest thing ever. He says, I'm thankful God gave me a dad like you. I love you. My dad protects me in bed. <laughs> dad, you are the best dad in the world. Aaron and dad, and we're saying hi to each other. Is that the coolest thing ever? So I'm keeping that one. That's great. Isn't that awesome? crazy how that works. It's crazy. God expanded my capacity to love and for love each time I thought I couldn't love anymore. So when I feel bad about myself and the choices that I've made, you know, when I feel insignificant, I just think about all the love that God gives me for my kids and I begin to understand how he can love me as much as he does. When we love others, we are sharing something very intimate, something very special. But it's only possible because the creator of the universe loves us. Today, as you've been listening, maybe you've been one who feels, you know, I'm just bad. I'm just a bad person. Maybe that's you, you know? I want you to step away from the condemnation of your sin, and I want you to accept his love. You can do that. You can embrace it. You can receive his love for you the love that covers your sin. Some of you wonder how God could love someone like you. You know, you feel insignificant. You need to know that God will, would still have sent Jesus if you were the only human being on earth. He still would have sent Jesus to rescue you. That is how much you mean to God. There is nothing that can separate you from his love. Romans 8, 20, uh, 38 and 39 says, For I am convinced... That neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor any height or depth, nor anything else in all creation, anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is so true. Easter Sunday, the day that we celebrate our Savior, who didn't only conquer sin, which he did on Friday, right? Right? but who also conquered death itself. Amen. Who has made it possible for us to be restored in relationship. You can know God personally. You can know him intimately. And he can change your life. 